Hello, everybody. We're wrapping up our second annual World Keratoconus event here at Northeast Ohio Eye Surgeons in Akron. It is my favorite event of the year where we celebrate this world awareness for a disease that many people don't know about. It was amazing to bring together people that have this condition along with their family and friends. We kicked off the day with a one mile walk run to raise funds for the National Keratoconus Foundation. We had a DJ, a balloon wall, we took selfies, we had a great breakfast, but more importantly, we shared knowledge and stories about everyone's journey. Everyone's journey is so different. We talked about scleral lenses, cross-linking, new technology, cornea transplants. We had a wide variety of people that all were able to bond together to bring awareness and share what meant the most to them about this condition. We will continue to work, research, and care for these patients and celebrate this day every year. I cannot wait to have our third one. You know I always try to make it bigger and better. So we're here for you. Remember, November 10th is World Keratoconus Awareness Day, and we'll see you next year. So tell me, you know, what is this keratoconus? You know, uh, we just had World Keratoconus Day, and you know, what do you tell patients about this thing, keratoconus? Yeah. So keratoconus is an eye disease. Um, it's not something that's contagious. It can be potentially genetic. We can also get it from rubbing our eyes. And it's where the shape of the cornea, the clear window on the front of the eye, literally becomes cone-shaped. That's what keratoconus means, cone-shaped cornea. And that causes an irregular view inside the eye for the patient. They can't see very well. They'll see blurry vision, sometimes ghosting or double type images, and uh, halos and glare. So it's yeah. a pretty devastating condition. Here at Clear Choice Laser Eye Center, we see a lot of patients that come in, they've been wearing contact or glasses for some time, and they're like, okay, you know what? I've, I've, my vision's changing. I want to get out of my glass or contacts. I want to get laser eye surgery. So, so in the process of evaluating patients for laser eye center, we do a number of different things, but one of those includes uh, a topography map, meaning we're mapping the front part of the eye that tells us, is that eye normal or not? Uh, sometimes we catch this condition, mm -hmm. keratoconus, which means that there's a thin area and sort of an abnormally shaped area. Good news that we caught it, but unfortunately those patients yeah. are not good candidates for laser eye surgery. The reason being is laser eye surgery thins a cornea just in the act of reshaping it. And if you already have a thin spot, mm -hmm. it's kind of like taking a tire that might have a thin area and thinning it more. You're gonna have more irregular shape. You're gonna have maybe further bulging or pushing mm -hmm. forward of that cornea. So if somebody has this keratoconus, we do not want to do laser eye surgery. And it is, it's a tough conversation because these patients with keratoconus are struggling to see and they see their peers having right. wonderful LASIK surgery thinking, well, that's the end all be all. And your tire analogy is perfect because their cornea will become thinner and more weak from that, from right. having LASIK. And that is not something we want them to obviously experience. So it will in fact make things worse. And I, I do, I probably have a keratoconus patient ask me that every single day. And I have to have that conversation that yeah. it is the last thing we'd wanna do for them um, with traditional LASIK type surgery. Right. If someone's worried about keratoconus, mm -hmm. what do you recommend they do to have that kind of diagnosis ruled out? So definitely a complete eye exam. Yeah, there's nothing better than a complete eye exam. Right. But if we're still not getting great vision out of that eye exam, there are corneal maps called topography that can actually map the shape of the eye because yeah. someone won't look like they have a cone-shaped eye to you know just your fellow human being. Right. You have to map it and then you can pick it up very easily. Number one way to diagnosis is with corneal topography. Yes, yeah, so we have this tool that basically takes a picture of the eye and basically gives us a map of the front shape of the mm -hmm. eye and can tell us is it a normal shape or more cone shape. And ideally, we want to catch that early so that because there are treatments to help prevent it from getting worse. In the past, once you were diagnosed with keratoconus, it was like, okay, you, you, you're diagnosed, but you didn't have a great treatment. Um, so how do you describe to patients what the treatment options are when given that diagnosis of keratoconus? Yeah, yeah. so you know, we wanna start, if we're seeing keratoconus, especially early on, yeah. we wanna stop the progression. We don't want it to get worse because it is a disease that will get worse into your 40s and even 50s. And so we really want to consider corneal collagen cross-linking. And that didn't exist when I was first in practice. And now it's a very regular thing. We're doing it you know, every week for patients across the country to slow down progression. And it's a very easy surgery. You can talk about how simple it is um, yeah. for patients. It's not going into an OR. We do it right in right. the clinics. And the way that cross-linking works is actually we use a 
a drop called riboflavin that we administer in the office for about a half an hour. And once the uh, eye has absorbed that uh, riboflavin, we then use UV light that activates that vitamin inside the eye and strengthens the tissue and helps prevent it from progressing or getting a weak spot or a thin spot and helps prevent that irregular shape from getting worse. Uh, so cross-linking doesn't turn the clock back typically, it just locks it in place and prevents it from getting worse. But we also do have treatments that help um, reshape the cornea to give it better vision. So if somebody comes in with uh, advanced keratoconus that has lost vision, we have a treatment called CTAC, which is one of our newest therapies where we use custom laser-shaped uh, tissue that reshapes the cornea based on that map that we talked about mm -hmm. and that irregular shape. And it more or less gives that irregular shape now some normalcy and kind of reshapes it to uh, more or less restore vision to where it was prior to that uh, keratoconus progressing. And both surgeries are, are so much less invasive than you know having a corneal transplant, which used to be the mainstay. Cross-linking, we talk to the patients the whole time. They put on music. They can look at right. their phone. I mean, it is non-invasive. There's no cutting into the eye. It's done, right. as we said, in, in the clinic. That's right. So it's really nice to stop things earlier. So I think our message is just you know, get your eyes checked annually. The, nothing is better, as I said, than a complete eye exam. And if something is not correcting to a healthy level, a 2020 level, or you're just not seeing out of glasses or contacts the way that you think you should, you might need to take it to the next level and go and, you know, have these corneal scans done. And your eye doctor should be recommending that to you. CTAC, you're one of the few in the country doing that. Yeah, so CTAC is, you know, it's brand new. We, we, uh, I think we're one of the uh, first five in the U.S. to offer that. That is so cool. Um, yeah, it's been great to work with a company called uh, Corneagen. That's the one that custom creates those, that tissue with a laser that we implant to help reshape the cornea. So it's cool to be on that leading edge, and it's great to finally have uh, a procedure that can mm -hmm. increase that quality uh, and help kind of turn that clock back and recover some of the vision that was lost. To keratoconus. And I think an important thing to mention is that the <clears throat> mainstay of treatment, if you couldn't get good vision in a contact lens, was a corneal transplant, a full corneal transplant. That idea is very daunting to someone that's 30 right. years old. That's right. Now we can help them sooner with less surgical interventions. These are minor type surgeries compared to a major procedure where you're on eye drops for the rest of your life. Um, with a transplant and they don't last, a transplant doesn't last forever, so someone young may have to have two or three in their lifetime. That's right. The number of transplants has gone down significantly in the country and even our cornea specialists are saying they don't wanna do them because they know there's so many, so many healthier, better options for patients. That's right. It's yeah, huge. I think hopefully if we can, you know, in theory we could eliminate all corneal transplants mm -hmm. if we can catch uh, keratoconus early uh, stop it, uh, stop the progression with cross-linking. And then we have so many other therapies to recover that vision with contact lenses, CTAC, um, there's custom lasers, all, a number of different things that we can offer for these patients. And I think it's important to mention the technology that's finding keratoconus has improved so much over the years that's as right. well. We used to think the number of keratoconic patients was about one in 2,000. Yes. We are thinking it could be as low as one in 500, even one in 250, having a little bit of early keratoconus. And we have machines that map not only the front surface of the cornea, but the inside surface to That's give right. us that information. Yeah. And that has changed my career path, I think, completely having that. I know contact lenses can be used in keratoconus. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the different options we have when patients come in for contact lenses for the treatment of keratoconus and getting that better vision. Yeah, so there's plenty of options in those. Yeah. My favorite by far is scleral lenses, so I wanna definitely make sure we talk about those. Okay. Uh, the good old days of RGPs or rigid gas permeable lenses, they're about you know an eight millimeter lens. They rest directly on the eye. They are a little more um, uncomfortable, people would sure. say. There's still a place for those, and they tend to be pretty affordable options and healthy options. But scleral lenses are phenomenal. In my practice, uh, I work with a bunch of cornea specialists and very you know, unique shaped eyes, and I have found that scleral lenses, which old technology, scleral yeah. lenses Leonardo da Vinci developed, so we're talking old technology. Sure. Back in the day, they were made of materials like glass that were pretty dangerous in the eye. And so in the past 20 years, they've made a resurgence. And I've probably made that my full, almost full clinical focus now is fitting patients in scleral lenses. And so now with sclerals, I'm kind of 
working both you know, what surgical interventions can we do and right. how can we still help them for their best acuity with these contact lenses. So that's kind of what I've based my last 15 years of, of career on. Yeah. They don't touch the cornea at all, and we're kind of worried in a disease process of the cornea that maybe something shouldn't be sitting on directly on the cornea. And so these are fully supported by a liquid layer of tears underneath the scleral lens. So what's better than having you know a bath of tears on your eyes right. all day long? So we actually have these larger lenses. So they're a little intimidating at first because they're yeah. about you know 16 millimeters, uh, the size of maybe a, a quarter. And then they're filled with tears, a, a preservative-free solution of tears, and then they're placed on the eye and they create a nice round surface again. So we talked about these patients having an irregular cone shape. Scleral lenses then right. give them this nice, round, perfect shape to give them phenomenal quality of vision. We can often get patients back to a 20-20 acuity level with these lenses and they're comfortable. You can wear them all day long. They're very breathable. They do require a little maintenance. You know, there's special cleaning and solutions you're hearing me talk about, but once people get used to them, I have an 11-year-old wearing scleral lenses in my practice and I have a 97-year-old wow. wearing them. What a so when you're motivated and patients with this disease are to see the best they can, right. these are life-changing, completely life-changing. And beyond, let's say, uh, keratoconus, who else might benefit from a scleral lens? I'm glad you asked that because yeah. I do fit them for quite a few other conditions. So I talked about them being feel, filled with tears, sure. dry eye patients. Chronic dry eye patients do wonderful with wow. these lenses. Or anyone that has a corneal scar, maybe they had a past infection or an injury to their eye. Um, sometimes that's only on one eye and I'll fit a scleral yeah. lens. So anyone with an irregular shape or an extremely dry surface that maybe has failed on medications for dry eye, yeah. these really create a protective shell for the eye and, and a lot better quality of vision. If a patient says, hey, you know what? I hear I can wear a contact that can help treat my keratoconus or help give me better vision mm -hmm. with keratoconus. Can they just get that on 1-800-CONTACTS? No, please no. <laughs> so, so tell me, how does a patient find the right doctor that's going to be able to fit that keratoconus? Does everybody have the ability to treat that uh, specialty contact lens or where, where, where do they find you? So we are, like yeah, we're all trained in school to fit them, but then it depends on who wants to keep going with that, right? Because it does become more of a specialized skill set, something that you really devote your career to. You don't just dabble in fitting patients in keratoconus lenses. So there are definitely a, a smaller number than I would like in our country of people fitting scleral lenses. It's growing. A lot of it is word of mouth. We make sure we advertise that we have difficult to fit options for patients yeah. in our clinics. Uh, a lot of referrals from local eye doctors that are, you know, saying, well, you know, Dr. Greiner fits those down the yeah. street, I don't, so I will share that patient. You know, I'm not going to take their patient, I'll fit the lenses and then they'll go back to their regular eye doctor they've known for 20 years for their annual care. So there's a nice, like, co-management type model yeah. in that, but probably I will tell you for every 50 eye doctors, there's probably only one of us that would be fitting. So it is a, a small number, but it's definitely growing. So it's a specialized skill set. It takes a lot of time. Um, and I think just hand holding with the patient to get them through that process to get the right fit. So Dr. Wiley, I do have aging patients with keratoconus. Sure. And so I'm sending them for cataract surgery. And I'd like to kind of pick your brain today on what new technology options are available for them in cataract surgery. Sure. Yeah. So uh, ultimately, you know, as eyes age, they develop cataracts. And so our patients with keratoconus, one day in their lives, will have a decision to make when they have their cataract removed. And when we do cataract surgery, uh, we're removing the foggy lens and putting a new lens back inside the eye. And we have some options with that new lens. If you have keratoconus, there are some unique lenses that may be well suited to help improve the quality of vision. And two that come to mind is one is called Aptera. And yeah, Aptera is good. basically a lens that has a small pinhole optic. So if you ever go to an eye doctor and they hold that little occluder and they, they have you look through a little pinhole and you're like, wait a minute, everything got, just got more clear. So that happens that when you look through a small pinhole optic, it actually blocks the irregular light rays and increases the quality of vision. Sometimes it can also increase not only distance, but near vision. So the Aptera lens can be a great lens for somebody that has keratoconus because it can uh, block some of that irregular light and, in, and more or less increase that quality of vision. One of the other lenses that are nice is the light adjustable lens. And the light adjustable lens is a custom lens uh, for each patient. So what happens is when we take the cataract out, we put this new lens inside the eye, let the eye heal, and then we use light therapy to fine tune the prescription of the lens after it's already inside the eye. So cool. Yeah, it's super cool. So uh, it can help kind of with those 
challenging physio, if you, if you have keratoconus, you know that the eye doctor is often struggling trying to fine tune and get that mm -hmm. best, which is better one or two when, you, when you're behind the four-opter, mm -hmm. uh, behind that lens machine and trying to get that best prescription. Well, the light adjustable lens gives the eye doctor the best chance to find a custom prescription that's tuned to your eyes after cataract surgery. So those are sort of the two lenses that are unique and often helpful for patients that have keratoconus, uh, the Aptera lens with a pinhole or the light adjustable lens to kind of custom fit that prescription to fit their eye. And they did not have these options even just a few years ago. Right. I mean, it's amazing. And then, you know, if they ever do need to go back into scleral lens where they can, the That's implants right. you're using are inside their eye, but this could give them more hope of maybe having more freedom from wearing glasses or contact lenses for their disease. That's right. I love it. I, I, I know we should mention this, you know, a public service announcement. One of the key things that all patients should be aware of is do not rub your eyes. I think we yeah, see no, rubbing. no eye rubbing, right? Like, that's the one thing if like probably everything that is in common with keratoconus patients, almost all of them are eye rubbers to some degree. They might not even know it. I stop strangers in public. It's really? bad. Yeah, it's bad. I'm like, oh, don't do that. And like, who are you? Like, yes. Oh, I'm your fellow eye doctor, but I need you to not rub your eyes. It's that bad. It's that bad. My dad used to say, my dad's a retired ophthalmologist. He said, you can rub your eye as much as you want with your elbow. So, <laughs> I just so, was thinking how I was yeah, going to do that. Yeah, so basically. I'm going to use that one. Yeah, I'm going right? to steal that. Yeah, he's like, so he would tell me as a little kid, I'd grow up, I'd be like rubbing my eyes. He's like, stop rubbing. He's like, I was like, Dad, I have to. It's itching or whatever it might be. He's like, okay, you can rub it as much as you want with your elbow. So, meaning don't rub your eyes, yeah. you know, uh, for so many reasons. But number one, that rubbing weakens the tissue mm -hmm. and pushes that normal shaped cornea into more of a cone shaped cornea. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, stopping eye rubbing is critical. And you yeah. don't see your eye look like a cone until we map it. So it's these gradual changes in that collagen that That's create right. this funny shape. And then these patients can't see if their cornea becomes a cone shape, they can't see out of glasses. Yeah. So I always feel bad because people will tell them, oh, just put your glasses on. Well, usually with that irregular shape, glasses don't work. Yeah. And that's where they have to think of other options that we can offer them. Totally agree.